everybody for coming. Um, and before I make the introduction, I'd like to remind everybody to please turn off your cell phones and please, there's no recordings. We have someone formally recording uh, the lecture that will be available and we'll get that information back out to you after the talk today. So we're in for a real treat today and it's my pleasure to introduce Queen Marquetta L. Goodwine who is a published author, computer scientist, lecturer, mathematician, historian, columnist, preservationist, environmentalist, environmental justice advocate, and founder of the Gullah Geechee Sea Island Coalition. She is the first Gullah Geechee person to speak on behalf of her people before the United Nations and is one of the first inductees to the Gullah Geechee Nation Hall of Fame. In 2008, she was recorded at UNESCO headquarters in Paris, France, at a United Nations conference in order to have human rights story of the Gullah Geechee people archived for the United Nations. And more recently, represented her people at the Global Climate Action Summit at the UN in 2017 and 2018. She has also provided leadership in creating the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Act that was passed by the U.S. State Congress that was signed into law in 2006. Finally, Queen Quet has been the recipient of numerous awards in recognition of her work and devotion to the Gullah Geechee people that include the United States Jefferson Award for Community Service, several awards for Gullah advocacy from the state of South Carolina, the inaugural Living Legacy Award from the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, and is featured on the Wall of Heroes at the National Wilderness Society headquarters in Washington, D.C., where she was also pr presented with the Ocean's Hero Award. These are just a small sampling of her accomplishments. And after her talk today, please stick around for a reception that will take place both in here and outside of this room. So with that, in keeping with her tradition, I ask that you all please stand and join me in welcoming Queen Quet to the University of Florida. Try for. See with. 
Wie geil, machen wir denn bitte? Und nicht der auch, oder? Lang, schwarz, wie der hängt da um. Ja, schon. Gar nicht ohne Fahrt. Hey, machen wir das denn? Ich muss bargehen. Sei gut, Gott, wo das ist. Wie gut. Hola, quick water. Da kann ich. Over top of him. He said, great God. Away him. That chill out, that boy. That chill out there. No, see. This man different than yet. But these chill out keep doing do that cracky thing that they do about this shit. Huh? Great God. What water the kind? We have a no, see. When we crack with Tina, say, the water the ring me. Water go attack me back. Say, the water. What about acid? We say, we don't use no drugs here. This is not acid certification. We say, what are? They say, they are trying to shellfish in there. Or you all to get a shellfish drugs. No, ma'am. But what are the cracky teeth about? It's say, acid certification. We say, how do say acid there in the gully kitchen nation? They say, they think they in the water. We say, we ain't want that. Then I don't ask the children come say, well, we go in the water with the gun. Why would I go in the water with the gun for? It say that's your gun called seismic. We not use no seismic. We know about rifle, shotgun, pistol. What seismic? They say, that is when he threw up there in the water and did like that. I said, we have out. I said, we have done coming in. What I say, we have out. I said, no sound way. I said, well, what did you do? Know? What did you do? Know? Yes, man. I said, so what does that have to do with the acid? They said, yeah, it got nothing to do with them. Well, what did you put the gun out there for? They said, because they're looking for the black gold. I said, we did the black gold. <laughs> no, 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 man. And are you there to look for? Oh, not this your time? No, man. I look for all. I said, oh, Texas tea. <laughs> I say yes, man. That's the way they come here for. See, because the land, if they think, say, might be had some old job. Think? They ain't know. They say, no, that's what they use a gun for. I said, we need to control the gun on that. <laughs> okay? I said, no. Tell on the children, the gun coming over here. Like, yeah, man. <coughs> but you're still going to crack your teeth with the acid thing. What are the acid thing? They said, that's what we're going to study about. Because now, the shelling thing in the corner, he did. And the shelling thing in there, I said, the Austin can't do it. Because Austin needs to sell for lick pond like a this shell. And then it go up into the big Austin. Then it can clean up the water and thing like that. So then we have the water we need. They said, yes, ma'am. But, see how hot it is? I said, ow! How the car see how hot it is? I'm sure I feel it. Great, go. They said, yes, ma'am. I said, so, oh, when I say, oh, this shot coming together. I said, so, then got chill and fire that gun and dig up that black hole and dig out Jonah. Then that thing got half pound upon the land. And then the rest of us, we got problems now for things for me now, pun. And you can't, we got half problems for things in the water for me now, pun, too, because of the acid. Yes, ma'am, I'm gonna go. I said, well, sir, why the man that chilling so fool? They said, we ain't no. I said, why do you can't stand how we burn all of the thing on standing? You have a living balance, you know. You know, why don't you want to tap everything with D.O.D.? And we are digging for that thing down, you know, for something, go out for them down in there for do. And tell them, look, bring them up. Yes. This is the same thing with the crack your teeth, both man. This is a, you take what you have with that chilling. I said, mm. what do you want me to do, pray for them? Because I ain't never talking to them. He said, well, maybe Hona will come there and talk to him sometime. I said, well, which one the children Hona want to crack with you with now? He said, I'm chilling down in Florida. I said, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I said, I'm chilling down in Florida. Life will build over everything what they did. 
The children ain't fussing over a tree until they go in front of the computer and look and see the pictures. They said, no, no, man, we got some trees still in Florida. I said, where? <laughs> I said, this thing they tell me, say, you used to have water. And they put up all the city on top of that. Say that man named way named in a flag, flag lost. Say him bull up all kind of things. They didn't run the railroad track. And once you do that, great God, they all become dumb. And now what do they want we for crack we teeth to say? They got tear up something in concrete. They got tear up something in asphalt. They say, well, they might don't do all that, but they don't understand how how for try for balance is your thing. I say, why? Because it's hard. They say, that might be them. I say, why? Because the hurricane is taking the car again. And they say, yeah, they know about that. I say, I know they know about that. I said, maybe we can crack with you a little while with them. But you know, they get down yonder, blow that thing. And God, you see, when they blow that thing like that, in Jacksonville and thing, they in Uli, one year, all that kind of thing like that. You can't crack with you like this, you can't crack Cause then I'm talking like the Buckler Taylor, and then the Buckler Taylor and tell them, say, ain't no such a thing like that. I say, no, how do I the language? So they get there, they talk like this in Florida. <laughs> Even if they are going to they talk like this in Florida. So really? You want me to come talk to them? You know, talking is one thing. But are you getting any understanding from the conversation? And if we don't speak the same language, there might just be a little bit of a problem. Now, when I talk to scientists, we don't usually do a lot verbally. We use a lot of these things here. We sit up here and we put mathematical formulas up and we calculate the risk of what we're about to do. And I said, they got a lot of miscalculations down in Florida. <laughs> I said, because how do you engineer entire cities on sinkholes? <laughs> and then wonder how come your house ain't there tomorrow. <laughs> You're looking for cousins and stuff, you thought they moved to another country, don't no, look down. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you want me to talk to them where? In Florida. I said, I might stand a better chance talking to the gator. <laughs> <laughs> we might communicate well. And somebody told them people at University of Florida, she said she'll talk to y'all. I didn't mean them. <laughs> but it worked out. So here it is then. As people start to think about what they've already done, and they realize there were some failed calculations, there were some inaccurate representations in the numbers engineered to say that building on this peninsula, this panhandle, meant that you could build forever on it as much as you wanted, and it wouldn't sink, it wouldn't go under, it would not create a hole. And they've learned after billions of dollars have been spent trying to repair and replace, repair and replace, that maybe what needs to be replaced is the natural environment that all this was before. Maybe you need to replace Western thought with that of the indigenous people. Like the Seminoles, who are Gullah Geechees, a lot of them, the ones y'all call the Black Seminoles, those are actually native Gullah Geechees that migrated from Carolina southward, just didn't continue on westward. And the ones that went westward are called Afro-Seminoles. And when they kept going even further into Mexico, they're called Muscogo. Are their conversations the same there as they are here, pretty much? Only difference is, since Florida has water still surrounding all of it, you still see it. You go to Tejas, and you cross bridges with no water on them. Hmm. And I'm like, why is there a bridge here? It's no water. <laughs> and they say, because, Queen, there was water there one time. I said, really? And I used to want to be bewitched for just a couple hours. I could twink my nose and move things and move people and drop a whole bunch of Gullah Geechies with me crossing a bridge where there was no water under it and say, look at how blessed we are because we look at water every day and we think it's always going to be there. Mm -hmm. And we also thought it was always going to be there at the level it was when we were born. And now it's not just those couple of times a day that we see it going up. Now what we used to call a springtime has now replaced this as a king. 
I said, wow, how in the Sea Islands do you go from Sea Island cotton being king to the water that has brought my ancestors here to this place in this space being the king instead? And as the queen, what kind of royal dialogue can I have with this new king to say, you need to go settle back down? Because this ain't sustainable. You and I can't occupy the same space at the same time. See, my crops need to grow there. And when you come in, you ain't fresh water. You bring the salt onto the land. We don't need the salt till we go out to the creek. I need you to keep that out there. Can you do that for me, King? You rule that. Let me rule this. He said, I'm sorry. <laughs> ain't your fault, Queen. It's them other churns. If they didn't build right up into me, <coughs> I might have could have stayed out there where I was. But they displaced my family like they did yours. Areas that were estuaries, they built on them. Areas that were marshland, they filled it in. They put buildings on it. So my cousins had to pile in with me, and I just had to do something. I had to get up a little high. So I'm sorry that I overflow some time onto your shore, but maybe we can dialogue here. Try to work this thing out. Because see, not all of them can communicate with me like you do. You don't, you come down here and sit and you just be quiet and you listen to God talking through every drop of what makes us who are. The rest of them turn running around. If they come out here, they got the camera. <laughs> <laughs> they're not sitting down listening to anything they're not even noticing that at one point they got out their cars and they had to come pretty far to get to me now they come out their cars and I'm right where they parked their cars and that's been the course of just Years, not decades, not centuries. They didn't even notice that the tree they used to be able to come and sit under is not there anymore. Or is it? Oh, it's there. It's the driftwood they're sitting on top of now doing this. <laughs> but what's drifted away is dialogue. What's drifted away is even realizing that the earth is also a living being like we are. What's drifted away is the fact that indigenous people would go to the water to nourish themselves. They went for spiritual purposes. They gathered what they needed for that time, just enough to feed themselves and their families. They didn't go there to derby fish and try to take the whole ocean back with them wherever they came from. And they didn't say, you're so pretty that I need to build on top of you. They lived inland. And they didn't come and visit the shoreline. My ancestors didn't know they weren't visiting a shoreline when they were kidnapped. When their entire villages were taken and then brought through the middle passage that we call the Atlantic Ocean that some people now think that the black gold could, might, maybe, possibly be in it. So why don't we just see if there's oil there for what? Maybe less than 1% of the whole American population to make more money off of? while everybody else suffers the anxiety of what if there is oil and what if it leaks? What does it now do to the villages that have been established in the Gullah Geechee Nation from Jacksonville, North Carolina to Jacksonville, Florida? What happens to us that live on the Sea Islands the way that not only the Igbo, Mandinka, Malinke, Yoruba, Gola, Gizi, Mendi, Temni, Fiki, Bibio had lived back in the motherland as coastal peoples that then brought that coastal attitude and energy here that to join with the Yemisee, the Kusabo, the Adisto, the 
decree that lived along this water that are our ancestors as well. In my family, I have both indigenous American, indigenous Gullah Geechee African blood that always says, you get enough for the family for the day and you leave the rest for the rest of the family for the future. You don't take it all today. It ain't all just for you. There are generations that came before that recognized we were going to be here now, and they left us something. So why are we so selfishly trying to take it all today and not thinking about those generations behind us and how they're going to come, and they're going to want to know why are we starving? Why do we have to stay in some type of bubble huts that we hope we can sustain the energy of the air conditioning in 300 days of the year because it's too hot to go outside. <laughs> that we'd have to start to engineer buildings where we have PowerPoint presentations of nature instead of being out in nature. Death by PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> As a person who's a computer scientist and mathematician, there's no logic to me to people continuing to do the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. And someone said, well, that is a definition for a word. I said, yeah, it's called insanity, right? They said, you got it. <laughs> I said, but every destructionaire that comes with a new design says to the rest of us, how now that is going to be sustained. And now because they hear the environmentalists using terminology like sustainability, all right, like global accountability. They now are paying environmentalists and they're paying communication specialists to come in and have public meetings and sell it to you as something that they want to do that's eco-friendly. They're calling it eco-tourism because they want to overbuild environmentally sensitive areas but then tell people you can come there for wellness retreats. Well, how well will we all be if we have thousands of those built over areas that are fishing grounds, over areas where there were oyster beds, and if you build this, you have to damage those oyster beds to get your heavy equipment in there, which means now the very natural filters that God made are killed. One oyster filters 50 gallons of water per day by itself. Imagine if we have an oyster bed the length of one of these tests. How many thousands of gallons that's filtering out per day? So yes, Gullah Geechee's are agrarian people. Gullah Geechee's are still seafaring and sea working people. But we are able to still be that because on the Sea Islands, we lived in balance with nature since the 1500s forward, since we've been there. And I'm a native of St. Helena Island, which is still predominantly Gullah Geechee. So I don't have to explain this to my folks. None of us build directly into the marsh. We don't build on ocean property. We go there. We get the thing from them, point. we go there and get the swamp. We go down on and this time I get the oyster and thing like that. They had the oyster rolls. They can the shell back and put them back in the water and thing like that. On the shoreline. Because if the shell beds are there, they protect the Spartina. We say Spartina because, you know, Tina is a good name in the Gullah Geechee community. Some of y'all might say Spartina. Okay, we say Spartina grass. And then that protects the maritime forest. The maritime forest is what makes us have a sea island. But as much as a sea island needs the life of those things I just mentioned, it needs the life of the deer, it needs the life of the foxes, it needs the life of the gators that are out there. Because somehow God set them all in order along with the snakes. The human snakes are the ones I have problems with, not the ones that slip around the right <laughs> that are there to keep things in balance. Every living being has a role to play and how we sustain and balance the earth. But some people's egos will not let them admit they're wrong. And herein lies the problem. If you engineered the foolishness, and you were the one who did the calculation that told us that the answer ultimately was 70, when the answer ultimately was really 170,000, you don't want to be known as that person who did that. And I'll give you a real example. I owned a corporation in New York City. Wow, what a wonderful job of how to take care of an island, huh? New York City. 
Right. <laughs> so, I owned a corporation now, but just as we were getting started, I still worked in corporate America. This particular job I had wasn't for me. I was like, these folks in here, something ain't right with these people. I got to get out. So they had what you call headhunters. Now, being a person who comes from the Sea Islands and looking like I'm looking, hearing of a headhunter sound like a bounty hunter, which wasn't a good thing at first. People had to clear that up for the country gal yeah, coming to the city. Like, no, they don't mean like that now. She's going to go hunt for jobs for you. Oh, okay, then that'll work then. <laughs> All right, so she contacts me and says, well, we want you to go in and do this interview. This is for a law book publishing firm. Blah, blah, blah. No problem. Great. Go over there. They loved me at the interview. They, she calls that even. They loved you. <laughs> oh, my God. So what day can you go back there? Because you have to take a test. They have to take a couple of tests. Okay, what's that? Okay, typing tests. Yeah, we used to type on typing machines for y'all who do your finger on your phone. <laughs> okay. So you used to type on typing machines, and then when computers came in, of course, you keep typing, right? So you would do typing tests to see how fast you could type, meaning accurately, though. Not just typing, like y'all text, and it don't matter if it's spelled right or wrong. <laughs> no, we had to get right. So there we did that, and so you got to do the typing test for easy, 90 words a minute at that time. Easy for me. They said, they also have some type of written test, no problem, love to read. No problem, man. I'm an honest student. Written test, easy thing. What else? Drug test, don't use drugs. Good, no problem. The headhunter went, what? She said, well, they're thinking Monday. I said, okay, so what time Monday? She said, but, but, but I'm saying, you know, Monday is after the weekend. I'm like, I know Monday's after the weekend. What's the problem? She said, because like I said, they have to do a drug test and I don't have a problem there. She said, well, if it was me, I'd have a problem on Monday with taking a drug test. I like, well, that's you, darling, and I need a new hand on her. <laughs> but that's not me. Don't have a problem. She says, okay. She said, do you eat bagels? Yeah. Why? Don't eat any bagels Monday. Why can't I eat bagels? It might skew your test. What kind of bagels you eat? I said, I usually eat the ones with the cinnamon and raisin. And all the plain ones. Why? Oh, not poppy seeds. I said, no. She said, because if you eat the poppy seed bagel, it'll skew your drug test. I said, oh, didn't know that. Good to know. Won't ever eat poppy seed bagels. <laughs> not into the drugs. Okay. So she says, all right, go ahead. I'll schedule it. Boom. Monday comes. I get over there. I sit down. This test that they say, they sent us like three people there. I finished this test. I'm up. I leave these other two people there. The lady goes, you needed something? I said, I'm done. Really? See, I'm done. She said, you answered all questions. I said, I answered all questions. I went back. I reviewed it. I don't believe I skipped any. You want to look at it? She looks at it. She said, okay, you're fine. Well, this is where you go, and we do the other stuff. Okay, type. Then they send me somewhere else to go do the drug test. Well, I get called two days later. She said, those people can't believe what you did. I said, what are you talking about? She said, you took the written test, right? They said, no one in all the years they have given that written test scored as high as you did. She said, you had a 90 or 95 on the written test. So they got curious as to where did she miss something? And they found it was one question, which was a math question, that you got wrong according to the answer key. But when they looked at the answer key, you had something like that 107,000, and their answer key said 70. So they're in the office that there's no way that this person got all this right and gets that wrong, and by that much, something's wrong. So someone actually sat and did the math problem and found out I had the right answer. The answer key was wrong. And they had been scoring people for 10 years with this test. <laughs> and, that. and so they said, you corrected their test? And they said, if you can do that, we're hiring her. <laughs> so my last corporate job I worked in, I worked at a law book publishing firm, never realizing that the day would come that I'd need to know more law 
than I ever thought I'd ever want to know about, much less fight for. To fight for land rights, to fight for human rights, and now to fight for earth rights. To say that it is our right as human beings to have clean water, that is everybody's right. To have sustainable agriculture, to not be fined for using natural medicinal herbs that are part of your cultural heritage and traditions, and to not be fined because of fishing while black. To say that because other people have come to our region and they quote unquote overfish, and they pollute with their boats because they put chemicals off the boats into the water, and that doesn't sustain the atmosphere. That we get fined because on the books, there's only laws for commercial and recreational fishing and nothing for subsistence. So now, I know that every journey has been one of divine order. Every step, every stop on a shoreline, every journey inland, to the mainland, to talk to people. Who know Karki teeth like a dish and thing like a dead and can't stand with tall, tall, and I go out there and do this show. And see that? That's what I said. I said, all these journeys to talk to a bunch of people who cannot speak like I do, that look at me crazy when I talk like this because they don't understand a word I said. Am I right? There you go. Um, has not been for long. It's been beneficial because it starts to get people to recognize that not all cultures are the same. Even sometimes when we live in the same state, it's not the same culture. And different cultural communities have different ways in which they engage with the earth and how they've been able to keep their culture alive, how they continue to adapt to the environment even when that environment is changing itself. And how do we continue to be what y'all told us, resilient in the face of it all? How do we get you to stop looking at your phone. Stop Googling and talk to folks. You're sitting right next to them and you're Googling about them. You're looking them up on LinkedIn and Facebook when you could ask the person about themselves. You sit here and instead of us be outside on a beautiful day having this discussion under a beautiful tree, because we know if we go outside, we hear all the horns blowing and the cars going by us and all that. We have to be inside. But y'all are waiting for me to point to the power on the wall instead of the power that's in the room? I never do PowerPoint. Because I come into spaces to make a point that part of what we've lost is our connection to each other. And the more we disconnect from each other, the people who just want to exploit the earth, they are connecting with each other. And in the meetings I'm in when they're there, they never have their phones on because they think the power brokers are in the room. And they want to look at each other. They want to read body language. They want to assess the value in that room. And they want to see how they can capitalize on it as they make investments with each other. But I say there are more of us than there are of them that care about the earth and know that it is ultimately the place that we better invest better in. And that means, means by divesting some of the things we used to do, building places, filling places to build more buildings, and just doing stuff just because everybody got to have an SUV. Two, three, four people at the house got an SUV. We all go into the same meeting, but nobody rides together. We have to divest from that selfish individualism and start to look at the world as what it is. One big sphere, one place that we all live on, where the water done brought we all together, because it's one ocean around the world. We can't let it become acidified and then become a poison from which we can't be fed, from which all the desalinization in the world will not give us clean water, because we cause irreparable harm to it. So we're at a critical point in time where we need to unplug, sit upon the shorelines and underneath the tree, and get it something for old landmark. And you might just find out that things start to cool off. When you got cool heads, you can reason together. And you can actually do what we've always done, sit out on the porch and have some sweet tea with the family. Because they still did it 
upon the Lamb, hundred and hundred years from now. And the king of the tide can't take them over. But it could reasonably be, so he's going back down. So when we talk about cultural sustainability and resilience and adaptation and all these terminologies, you can't talk about us in a lab like this without us here. So I really, really appreciate the fact that I've been given such an honor by your dean to be one of the scholars to return to UF. I got the welcome to UF, but actually I know I got some fans out here that were here the first time I spoke here last year. And so I guess I did speak good Gator language because y'all brought me back <laughs> to the swamp, all right, to hang out. And so I, I pridefully, I collect stuffed animals, so I pridefully have my gator from last year sitting up in the living room. And he looked like he almost gave me a wink when I left <laughs> the deck um, to come here again. So it is wonderful to be back in this swamp for good reason, to actually have a chance to talk about public health. Because all of what I've talked about, if we're all the public, all of what I said affects infects our health. No matter how close or how far, you actually live away from the shore. And so what are we going to do together? So we're going to have an opportunity now before y'all go out here and eat up all the free food. Because <laughs> I know that's the only reason some of y'all came. Y'all didn't have free food out <laughs> Then to, to have a little dialogue. So y'all have any questions? Don't get too personal. You might get an answer. <laughs> no? All right, good. Peace. <laughs> Any comments then? Might not have a question. Somebody might have a comment. Yes? No? No? Yes. Go ahead, my sister. Tell me your name. Uh, my name is Karen. Karen. I got a cousin named Karen. Uh, she good people. Uh, Check up on me. <laughs> <laughs> Google Karen right quick for me. <laughs> okay. um, so my question is within the community, um, how Which community? What, the Gullah Geechee community. Okay. Um, how, um, how aware and interactive is the, like, from older to younger um, people in the mm -hmm. community, how, how aware are they of these impacts to your community, mm -hmm. and how engaged are they in counteracting? Counteracting that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, this is the first thing. You don't have to counteract that which you want to cause them. So for most of our community members, they just continue to live in balance because our tradition is about living in balance. So the majority of native Gullah Geechee's, the elders, still teach the children, don't act a fool like them new people who moved in here. You need to do it this way because what they're doing is not going to stay there. So some listen and some don't. Some have learned the very hard way. Well, but I, but I like the new houses they built. And, um, and I mean, if we got that piece of property over there by the water, well, I can't build my house right there and look out at the water. And then they said, well, OK, we'll tell you what. Wait two more years. Just wait two years on that idea. But the next time you hear them say it's high tide, I want you to go stand on that property right where you want to put the house at. I want you standing now with your good shoes. Go stand, you know, and I, why is that tell me a lot? Just listen to what they said and do it. Now you get there, and like I said at the beginning, you can't, you can't even get there because you're bogging and you're going, why? Because all the salt water comes into that point. They knew that. So when they told you, all the people in our community don't like to talk long to you. You get on the nerve, they got to talk a lot. So they don't tell you no. Don't be, why, of what? You might just get, I said no. <laughs> they don't care how old you are. So, when you going to sit there and do all that, now they're going to give you, they're going to let you learn by experience. Go over there and you'll see why we tell you no. We only know this because we 90 years old. Our parents were here before that, and when we were little kids, that place always flooded. Rattle us now, as they would tell you. Okay? So there are things that are passed on from natural living that you don't then feel you got to get out here and combat something. They feel that's somebody else's job to do because they're not fault. We're not causing that problem. Now, what we are combating, though, 
is even the last two weeks alone, we have had destructionaires, y'all call them developers, um, <laughs> that have come to the Gullah Geechee Nation yet again with concepts. One, at Wadmalaw Island, they said, well, we're going to put tree houses here. It's just going to be tree houses. It's going to be a planned unit development, of, but it's made of tree houses, and they're going to be short-term rentals, so we're not really going to harm the environment. How are you not? You're still going to build up. You're still going to have impact. You've got to put foundations. You're going to have to put in piping and sewer and all. That is harm. Then, if you have people constantly coming and going constantly, the community never knows who those people are. So what kind of human impacts? Now people are anxious. They're locking doors on the island. They never used to have to lock the door because they knew everybody because strangers are there. What do you mean? So at least Charleston County Council was packed to stay in the room only. The people withdrew their application. That was last week. Now, the night before last, these folks decided to come to St. Helena Island, where I live, said, we're going to put the Six Senses Resort here called Bay Point, because we're building them in seashells, we, we're building it in New York, we, build, we work with folks at Maldives, and we also have built one, we started off in our headquarters in the Bangkok, Thailand, where everything is eco-friendly. What? <laughs> I've been to Thailand. <laughs> I've been to New York. What are you talking about? So they started talking about how this soap and their other stuff is eco-friendly, and how, again, we're not going to build even on the island. We're going to put 50 units, but we're going to prefab them over here, and then we're going to ferry them to what is actually a hummock, basically. There's only less than 70 acres of high land property there, where 107 loggerhead turtles gave birth this year. From five to 8,000 birds nest there every year, especially shorebirds, OK? So why this is fishing ground for us, and it's been that ever since we've been on St. Helena. Hilton Head wouldn't annex them into them. That's where they started three years ago. Now, if Hilton Head don't want to annex you, you think us on the rural sea, I don't want you? No, we don't care what term you use. So now we find ourselves having to educate the elders and the youth that don't listen to techno speak because what they're doing is they're now finding out what communities, what arguments communities would have with them invading. So now what they're all saying is, well, when we build, we don't do environmental harm. In fact, this is ecotourism and wellness, and people will be able to come. It's a luxury resort, but what we do is we don't do, they do it like that. So when someone asks them, is it going to be, what the lady say, is it going to be $300 a night? <laughs> we all scream, no, they are over four, over four figures a night. And people were like, what? I said, just Google them. Because mm. <laughs> they're actually no. IHG hotels, but they're selling it as Bay Point LLC because this is Bay Point that they want to take over and scatter all the wildlife and scatter our cultural community. So our elders and our youth have been trying to stay vigilant and on top of these issues, but keep up with all these new words coming in from the outside more than anything else, while maintaining the balance of our life. But how much stress is that cause? Especially on the elders. A lot of elders didn't even want to come in and meet me the other night because they just couldn't take arguing yet again. You see? So that's the big thing. So the good thing is because of social media and the ability to be activists that way, we put a petition on change.org to stop destruction at Bay Point. We had over a thousand signatures in one week, and the number is climbing. And I'm praying by the time I leave here today, we've gotten to the next thousand, to 2,000. And so here it is that the younger are showing the elders, well, y'all used to show up and protest. We can do this too, electronically, but we can't have this. And a lot of younger people are like, well, Queen, I wish I was coming home now, but at least I'm going to get this out because I'm at college and someplace else, or my job took me here, but I can still help this way. But I'm like, you can help that way, but you got to come home too, dog. So the elders can teach you to understand how you sustain it without doing what you see out there, here, because it's not appropriate for this environment. It's not to say there's not a place it can be done, but don't do it here, you see? So that's the thing. It's always about balance, and so it's about choice. Always. Now, our elders always taught us that. 
the big feast for now for the deep fish. But this time, we're the school of piranha, eating up the whale. That's how I look at it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, right there. What's your name? Hillary. Hillary. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Running for office? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, I guess if you are traveling and visiting new places that you're not from, like what are some things that you can Ooh, keep in dude. mind when there is all this stuff about like, yeah. oh, this is ecotourism, but is it really? Is but is it really? Yeah. Right. One of the things I would always say is try to find the natives. Whatever community it is in the world, especially try to find the oldest person there. And they tell you, oh yeah, there's this old lady, she like 90 years old and she loved talking to people. <laughs> See if you can find where she is. Spend an hour or two with her first and she will give you the skinny on what's real, what's not. She has nothing to lose, no reason to lie. Okay, usually that's a good insight into the community. Then follow community members. Ask them, is there some place that's community owned where y'all go eat? Somebody first will do this. They'll look at you, oh, Taurus, when the restaurants are on so and so streets, like, but where do y'all eat? Well, we're eating at the house. Was there any community open function where y'all might be hanging out? And somebody might say, well, there's a fish fry, but the fish fry is going to be in the park over here because there's a baseball game in it. Follow the locals, okay? And when you get there, you can just about ask anybody. Does anybody who's local do tours? They'll be the ones that usually do the culturally balanced, the eco-tourism stuff, because they're not going to harm their own home and their own community. They'll let you know which organizations, which museums, which environmental groups really work with the community versus some that are antithetical to the community. All right? So then support those. Support the crafts artists that you see that are the ones who don't necessarily have storefronts. The ones that you see in the little local community market, if there's farmer's markets, definitely go to those. Because you meet the most interesting people, but usually you'll find the majority of farmers there are local, very short distances from where they're selling the produce, and that helps you sustain the environment. That, to me, is eco-friendly, okay? And then, like a lot of times now, a lot of these big, huge, multi-million dollar properties you go to to visit beautiful mansions and whatnot and cottages, they actually do farm to table. So that's another place. If you look it up in advance and say, well, if we're going to eat lunch, let's eat there versus a fast food place. You see? And that's a way to really balance it. But always find some community place and spend some money there. Even if you only have a dollar or two to spend. Every dollar literally does count, especially for grassroots community organizations. Not everybody gets grants or anything. Yeah. I love the question, too. I don't often get that. Folks are speaking, well, I'm on vacation. I do what I want, right? <laughs> and contribute to the degradation of the earth, why don't you? Because <laughs> you have that attitude about it. And if you go somewhere that tells you it's a resort package, don't be held hostage on the grounds of the resort. Leave! Go outside, meet the locals. Anybody else? Nothing on this side? No? Questions, comments? No? Go ahead. Middle? Where? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, so, one thing you said about us being separated from each other by our phones, yeah. where, how would you suggest addressing other barriers in our lives, mm. such as the barrier between us and the sky now? Mm. and the two feet of concrete between us and the ground. Mm -hmm. Some of us don't even walk, touch the ground, right. you know, throughout the whole day. Mm -hmm. But as, how can we become more in touch with yeah. the earth yeah. and the communities like this that we live in, covered in concrete and walls? Yeah. The same way we just talked about that. It has to be a conscious effort. Same thing I said to her, everything's about decisions, right? We were in Barbados this year, and we were the first Gullah Geechee delegation to make the homecoming to go back there since the Barbadians had kidnapped our ancestors from there and brought them to settle Charlestown in 1670. We were the first official delegation of Gullah Geechees to go back and we were hosted by the country. But I also knew people who were in historic preservation there. So one of them told me when we were in Bermuda earlier this year, Queen Quit, I do a tour there. 
and it has some African history in the tour. And so when I get there, I have to take your tour. He says, at night, no problem. It's walking, no problem. I will wear appropriate shoes for that. Okay, we were on concrete and more concrete and more concrete. What does Queen Fred do? The rest of people can stay on this concrete. The minute I saw a, even a patch of grass, he'll tell you, I would walk right off from the group. He'd look like, where's she going? I'm like, I can still hear you. Go on a talk. But I would stand intentionally on the grass. We got to another place where we went stood on the sidewalk. I found where there was a bench on the grass. I went and sat. All of a sudden, he looked. He came and sat, too. Now, everybody else looking like, Ooh, such hatred for y'all. We'd like to sit out. <laughs> but it's choice. They didn't have to keep standing there because if all of us had migrated to the grass, the tour operator would have too. But he was just doing what he always does, always walking on the sidewalk. So we have to make conscious choices like that in urban settings to find it. It's usually there. But we're so accustomed to going by things so fast. Everything is moving with traffic. We become part of the traffic and don't even realize it. So you have to unplug yourself and be aware of your surroundings. Turn your phone literally off, not vibrate. Off. Turn it off or don't bring it with you. And you be surprised how many things you notice now. Because you're not distracted. Your senses are not tethered to this thing. And notice, I'm a computer scientist, so what y'all call cell phones are really PDAs, personal digital assistants. They're programming you. You're not programming them. They have them y'all trained to look. I gotta check it. What do you mean they go off? What? Okay. So you have to make conscious decisions. No one's gonna die just because I turn it off. So every day for 30 minutes, or every day for an hour, and it may continue to increase after you go from there, I'm not doing that, but I am going to sit under this tree and I'm going to listen. I'm going to stand on this patch of grass, even if people look at you like you're insane. Like, that's not a bus stop. Why are that lady still standing there? That's not their business. <laughs> Go into complete meditation. Be a statue standing there. Eventually, they might put a cup down. They might give you tips. They might give you, put your cash app name on the on a board and stand there. They might give you money. Oh, she's a good mannequin. You know what I'm saying? She stands every day, and that's why. But you have to make a conscious effort. You're here in Florida, so even if you say, "Well, it's break time, it's weekends, or whatever," go to the water, whether that's swamp water or the ocean. Make it a conscious effort. You gradually get other people. Y'all start up all kind of groups on Facebook. Start a group, unplugging <laughs> and going out into nature. <laughs> okay, and see how many other people are just like you that want the same thing and say, well, you know what, I'll meet you. Let's both go sit on the grass together. Both, both stand there and be mannequins for 30 minutes every day. Okay, on the weekend, let's all get in one vehicle and let's go to a place where there's water. When I was here last time on your campus, I walked around a little swampy, no wool y'all had, and found a nice atmosphere. There were benches there. Now, of course, you, your mosquitoes are here, too. But <laughs> you can sit. They have benches. They have areas even on the campus. But if your phone's on, you probably didn't even notice. And you may have walked a mile every day. But take it in. Take some time to yourself. And you find your anxiety levels go down. Your health becomes better because your stress level is down. And unfriending on Facebook is one thing, but having stress in your real life is a whole nother thing. You can't unfriend people in real life. <laughs> if they're too stressful and aggravating, I don't care if it's your mama sometimes. You can't pick up that call. <laughs> Just let, she gonna be all right. She gonna still be her. When you pick it up two days later, yeah, mom, I know you called 55 times. I just couldn't take that right then because I had to sustain my health and my sanity. So that's what we got to do. So, it, so you'll find that you're walking, you're walking even lighter on the earth. You'll suddenly feel like the concrete does feel like grass and beats sand. It's about your mindset, even when you have to walk on it. And you start lifting up. You don't need ecstasy or none of that stuff to get up to the clouds. Y'all really don't. Y'all don't need weed or none of that. If you tune in to the natural environment, 
The clouds don't seem as far away anymore. They seem like how the tide's rising, they seem like they're lowering. And you can look up there and communicate and breathe it in and just let your imagination run wild. Imagine yourself looking down on them. I love taking flights because I love looking out the window. Let's get a window seat so I can just talk to God and see me walking out there. So visualize. A lot of it's here, more so than it's out here. It has to start from in here. Okay? Yeah. But that's choice. That's choice. Yeah? So, yes, sir. So, you bring, you bring culture. Y'all gonna say he didn't introduce himself. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's not the case. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. <laughs> so you bring culture, your culture, and you're sharing with us. Yes. And we're grateful for that. I appreciate it. There are so many different cultures. The culture of entitlement. Yes. And mm. the culture of value and what we value. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of the shifts that we deal with as, as an environmental health scientist, mm -hmm. um, I recognize that people value things yeah. very differently and that the kind of cultural shifts of those perceptions yeah. are ones that are sort of like a large tanker yes, or, or a diesel locomotive that you can't stop on a dime, you can't right. turn mm -hmm. readily. That's right. Cultural shifts you Unless know, you jackknife. Take, take a couple of <laughs> decades sometimes. <laughs> right. And so how do you take your leadership and your voice mm -hmm. and address these very big issues yes. that are really cultural at heart? Absolutely. One of the biggest things that I say to people all the time is you meet people where they are. So a lot of times I'm in these big meetings with these multimillionaires and stuff that are talking about issues, but really the bottom line for them is how can they make more money? So you have to then try to meet them where they are. Since money is their dynamic, you have to show them how, well, maybe divesting out of what you used to make money and into these new things that are renewable and that are sound could still make you some money. Well, how do you figure that? Right? And then you start to invoke certain things, and I bring my cultural heritage into it. And a lot of times, everybody I know loves seafood, or they love being in the ocean at some point. So when you start talking to them about that, and I say, the sea islands, I say, haven't you been there? Of course, I believe one of your islands is Hilton Head. Yeah, don't you go out there? Yeah, well, let's talk. Wouldn't you like it if there were less people there? Yeah, it has gotten a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> now we can talk. Okay, so the thing is, meet people where they are. And when they see that you're interested at least in something about them, the dialogue becomes easier to have. And again, now they might even move over and let me drive. See? But they didn't even realize. They moved over, and now I'm going to turn the truck ever so slightly. They don't even know the direction has changed yet. By the time they do, they're seeing a new scenery. And they're like, hey, but this is nice. You never saw this before. Right, you couldn't because you were hanging out with your same friends, talking about the same things, doing the same things in the same places, the same way. That's not going to last for your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. If we go this route, maybe something can be done for them. You know how you guys are. Don't you want your sons to have industry, too? Well, you know everybody can't get in the same business. You don't want your son competing with you. Here's something new he could do. Come on, let's talk about that. And your daughter, she's already ready. I mean, she gets it. So I think you really should make her the CEO, you know. Maybe your son can be the CEO on this because she's got it down. You think so, Queen? I'm telling you. <laughs> and you get them in the dialogue. If it's about a personal thing, they're more open to it. If you come in there and say, I hate y'all's guts because y'all are the ones who destroy everything for all of us. Well, now we're up for a fight right away. Because mm -hmm. it's an argument all day. How dare you? You don't know me. And we get nowhere. So let's, let's meet on some common ground if we can. And I'm not saying all the times we can. Some people cannot be helped. So those are people that you know, you have to then say, okay, this is just an enemy. So now we have to have another strategy. How do we combat the energy, this enemy? That's it. So on the tree of life, there's all things. But it'd be nice if we could just have the nice, smooth dialogue sometimes you got to go to war, and that's unfortunate. So my thing is, why go to war? Who really wins? We could sit down here, fellas, on the shoreline and have a beautiful, sweet tea with a fish rod. They'd be like, Queen, we need to come see you. Come on over. I've had almost every Democratic presidential hopeful come meet me this year. 
If someone had asked me 10 years ago that you'll be meeting all these people, I'd say lies. But they want to talk to me. They said, we heard about you. I go there, they say, Queen Quet, we know who you are. And we know you're fighting for your people. If my administration comes in, what can we do together? They don't have to talk to me. There's nothing that says they have to, but they are. Because they're now recognizing these indigenous people have sustained themselves on sea islands that are in a hurricane zone in spite of all that's been done to eliminate them. They got some resilience we need to have in Washington. So if I can get people in Washington to talk to me, I think anybody will talk to me. You know? And I've, I've even, I think the greatest thing before that was I had someone who had been, what I do this every time for him, is it Grand Wizard or Grand Warlock? <laughs> Grand Wizard. Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. We sat down and we talked together. He's reformed. And he said, everything is about white supremacy. It's not about anything else. It's not racism. It's not anything. It's about white supremacy. And as soon as you know that, you can talk to anybody about anything. And he and I were like this in the room. And the other people of African descent couldn't believe that. They couldn't understand how, is, how are they doing that. And he made one comment one time, and I told him, keep that under your hood, though. That one keep under your hood. And everybody fell out laughing, including him. <laughs> you know, but we had a real, a real conversation. And he was very sincere about how wrong he had been the majority of his life. And now he helps to promote Harriet Tubman and all of what Harriet Tubman did, and her legacy. And he's like, and Queen Quet, you remind me of her. So if he could talk to me, I think God will have whoever I need to talk to me. And let us turn that truck around. Let us turn that diesel engine. Let's move it. Let's move the ship. I'm always about boating. I'm an island girl. Tides raise all boats. So we can get them to... Go down when this king time does too. So now what I'd love for all of you to do for me, if you've gotten any benefit out of this discussion today, is a couple of things. One is if you would go to change.org when you can turn your phones back on, because I know y'all scurred right now. I've got not touch this phone, she got told us that. That's right. <laughs> you go to change.org and look for stop destruction at Bay Point. Just Google it, it'll come right up. And please sign that petition. Share that petition as many places as you can to help us because they didn't withdraw. They didn't say we're not going to do this now at Bay Point. They just said, oh, well, we felt y'all's wrath tonight. That was one comment. Oh, we were like, you ain't felt wrath yet. Yeah. <laughs> no, and then, and then the, other, then the owner said, well, I've had the property 20 years protecting it. Maybe I just need to keep doing that. But he didn't say we're not going to build. So until they say officially we're not going to build, we want thousands of people around the world to please keep signing that petition. And also, I am on the Healing the Land World Tour. So this is just one of many, many stops. Next week, I'll be going to the UK. And so we have a GoFundMe, which is sending Queen Quet to the UN. And that's been up for since last year's uh, missions to send me to the UN. So if you would support that, we appreciate it. The last time I was here at the college, what we did was, because a lot of students said, well, they take um, apps. And I told them before we started, I said, well, we didn't have Cash App before. I set it up now. So Gullah Geechee Nation is our handle on Cash App, the whole thing. Gullah Geechee Nation, that's us. So you can also do that or go fund me or do what the kids, students did last time. They just came up and donated. Because once I said every dollar counts, there wasn't one student in that lecture hall that didn't come up front. And I don't think anybody ever put a dollar in. I saw $2 bills, $3 bills, $5 bills, 10 They put them all in a basket I had on the table. And that was the money that helped me get to the UN last year. And you heard about the Global Climate Action Summit. And so this year, I've gone to the Ocean Action Summit. The UN flew us in. But they don't ever pay all your expenses, right? And so I'm going over to help launch the Climate, the Climate Heritage Mobilization Network, and we're going to be launching that in Scotland 
and this will be my first journey to Scotland, so we'll be leaving on Tuesday, and we'll be in the UK for a week talking to people there about who we don't over up and what we to do and how we can do it together. And so I uh, appreciate you doing that. And if you want to follow us on social media so you can keep up with all of what's going on and even the video that you see Kwame taking, that will show on Gullah Geechee TV. So you can subscribe to Gullah Geechee TV on YouTube. And a lot of these hearings, the meetings that I talked about, the videos are on there. All the testifying I've done before the U.S. Congress, the U.N., these things, they're on there. So you can watch them, embed them on your blogs. You can do whatever. So those things are available using your classrooms and everything. So if you follow GullahGeecheeNation.com, you can link to our Gullah Geechee Nation Facebook, at Gullah Geechee on Twitter, at Gullah Geechee on Instagram, follow the blog, you see everything's there. Um, environmental justice column, you see the Queen Quick column, you see all those things, and you can link to all of those. So we are on social media, we're very active on social media, so we do keep people abreast of what's going on. We do not do Snapchats. Okay, I don't have time for all that. All right. But we do have Delegation Nation on Facebook, and we also, like I said, are on Twitter and on Instagram, same handle, at Gullah So you see our national flag here. It has a tree in the middle of it where the human bodies intertwine. That is how you spell Gullah, G-U-L-L-A-H. Geechee is G-E-E-C-H-E-E. Ain't no I and Geechee if it a we. All right? So if you will follow those, you will keep track of all that we're doing. And I pray that this will not be my last time here in the swamp with the gators, all right? I actually like gators. I was playing with an alligator this weekend hunting mm -hmm. out as well. It was a small one. I wasn't no <laughs> one that I got to wrestle or look like your mascot. He ain't been that big. Um, <laughs> but his name is actually, his name is Clyde. And we have Bonnie and Clyde at the hunting island nature <laughs> center uh, that live indoors. And so he's about that big now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I got to pet him and everything before I came here. And so I hope that the same way I embraced him at home, and embrace his counterpart there that you all continue to embrace me here in the swamps at UF. So thank y'all once again. Thank you for everybody in this department that worked so much to get me here. And see, even a hurricane couldn't stop the queen from getting back here. <laughs> yes, so thank y'all so much. And I'll be up here signing books for my weekend. It's going to be right out here, and there's also some things that you can come and look up uh, related to Gullicci that Queen has brought for everybody to see. So thank you for coming. Thank y'all. Appreciate it.